Let's talk about DMT. What is it? DMT is a neurotransmitter, which is a chemical that allows neurons to communicate with each other. Other neurotransmitters are dopamine and serotonin, which we all know about very well, because they're responsible for how we feel most of the day. Some people call DMT a drug. Is it a drug? Yes. A drug is any chemical that we ingest that can influence our physical and or neurological state. In that sense, DMT is absolutely a drug. But so are coffee and sugar. In fact, if you drink enough coffee, you will hallucinate. Yes, coffee is a hallucinogen. So how can DMT be both a neurotransmitter and a drug? That's because those terms mean two different things according to the function and the situation. DMT is a drug when you consume it from the outside, like smoking it or ingesting it in the form of ayahuasca. But the second it's inside the body, it functions as a neurotransmitter. This tells us that we gotta be very careful with words when we're describing something. Because saying that something is a drug is not really helpful because heroin is a drug and coffee is a drug. A more useful way of looking at it is these things are tools that can be utilized for different functions. We use coffee to be productive. You drink too much coffee, it becomes destructive. Not all substances can claim this privilege because for example, with heroin, even though some people say that you can actually use it constructively, for the most part, for most people, it will be destructive. So we have to be very, very precise with what we mean by the words we say. These definitions follow only if we actually understand what is the function that it serves. So what does DMT do exactly? I've noticed that a lot of people commented that they think that when you smoke DMT, it's basically gonna start manifesting anything you think about. It's not how it works at all. In fact, one of the mysteries about DMT is that it doesn't manifest anything that we usually see in our imaginations. The building blocks with which the DMT visuals are constructed seem to belong to a different family of things that we've never seen before. It literally doesn't look like anything you've ever seen before. And that's a very important data point. Not only that it's not gonna make you more suggestible to what other people tell you that you might see, the things you do see is something that no person in the world could ever imagine. So they couldn't have possibly implanted that idea in your mind. A work that I highly recommend to check out on this subject is the work by Dr. Andrew Gallimore. Dr. Andrew Gallimore is a computational neurobiologist and he devoted his life to study psychedelics and specifically DMT. I highly recommend both of his books especially the latest one, Reality Switch Technologies. I'll leave the link in the description. In the book, Dr. Gallimore goes in depth about the basics of neuroscience. So he takes some time to educate us about how the brain usually constructs the reality that we see. And then he goes one substance after another, and he breaks down the exact mechanisms by which they cause the different effects that we see. But then there's a whole chapter dedicated to DMT. And he explains why DMT is so different Mostly because it's a complete reality switch channel. It's not like it's a modulation of the tapestry that you see around you. It is a complete shift of your regular reality and it switches to something completely different. And I know it can be frustrating for people who never did DMT or even psychedelics in general to try and understand what that might even mean. So just consider, for example, trying to explain color or visuals to a person who was born blind. It's inconceivable. And this is exactly the situation you find yourself in when you smoke DMT. It seems like the types of things that you see on it are of a new kind that your brain has never thought about before. One of the biggest points that Dr. Gallimore makes in the book is that the difficulty to explain what DMT does in neuroscientific terms is that the brain doesn't produce content. The brain sends a guesswork blanket or a field, if you will. And then only the things that impinge on that field through our senses are the things that the brain uses to triangulate what it thinks the external world looks like. And then it constructs internal models corresponding to what it thinks outside looks like. What it allows the brain to do is to preserve energy. Most of the content that you see throughout your day is not something that is being perceived by your senses. It is the thing that your brain thinks that is happening that doesn't meet an error. If I'm looking at a mug, my brain knows what a mug usually does. It just sit on whatever surface you place it on unless you move it. So it will guess that in the next moment in time, the mug will still be there unless you decide to pick it up. So as long as it follows the prediction of the brain and nothing new happens to the mug, the brain keeps projecting the image of a mug by the internal constructs that it created, and that way it doesn't have to spend any energy by allowing the senses to inform the models again. Now, if something happens to the mug that you didn't anticipate, then the brain sends an error signal and says, hold on, this is not what I thought will happen in this moment. So let's say if a ball hits the mug and it just flies off the table, you didn't expect that to happen. The brain then allows the senses to inform it more about what is happening now. But in this case, it still belongs to a family of things that sometimes does happen. 
So accidents happen, and the brain definitely has seen a ball before. So even though it's unexpected for that moment, it's not unexpected in general. And therefore, it's not going to take it very long to update the model again and find the right model and say, oh, ball, okay, I know what it is. What happens, however, if the content that sends the error message to the brain doesn't fit with any model that it has seen before? The brain is going to start struggling because it doesn't have the models to construct this new reality. So it has to go into some kind of an emergency mode in which it tries to construct reality in real time. So the problem with explaining DMT in your scientific terms is that the content you see on DMT is extremely coherent. And that's not something that the brain does. If you jumble up the signals in the brain, it doesn't all of a sudden produce some kind of a highly coherent image of something sophisticated that you've never seen before. That's something that will require a lot of energy, something that the brain doesn't do, which means it must be coming from somewhere else. And the brain is just struggling to try and construct new world models that will try and match and map what you're trying to see on the outside. All of this is to explain that it is simply false that when you smoke DMT, you will be suggestible, so anything people will tell you, you will see it. It's not how it works. So what I want you to consider is that we have to reframe the entire model of our world, and we have to think about it in different terms. The information that the brain receives is the main player, and if DMT allows for new information to come in that is extremely coherent, it cannot be explained by the brain being confused about what's going on. It is also why recalling something is not the same as seeing it in real time. It is true that certain people have really good visualization, but it's still not the same as a physical object, and we know the difference. It's very common to say that the brain doesn't know the difference between the thought of an apple and an actual apple. That's not quite true, because we know the difference. There's something that is different about a memory of an apple or an image of an apple in your mind's eye and an actual apple. And the content on DMT looks like a real object. It doesn't look like a fuzzy thing that hovers in front of you. And the code on the laser looks even more coherent than that. I want you to consider this. It looks like a regular digital clock, albeit extending infinitely into the distance, with extremely coherent structures and with language that even though we can't read it, is distinct. It is something that we can Hell is a language. It's very sophisticated. And I want to emphasize that it doesn't even look like the Alice and Gray characters that people ask me about. The Alice and Gray characters, they're still very blocky. So they can still be excused as some kind of a visual in psychedelics. But the language I'm describing, which is much closer to Japanese katakana, not quite, but very similar, it's much more difficult for the brain to produce such a coherent image of something that sophisticated if it's not actually there. It's a long conversation and we're going to keep having it. A lot of love to everybody. Bye.